Over the past 36 days, all of the major party leaders have been traveling across the country making pitches and promises. Thank Bill for his strong words, for his leadership. I want to thank uh, Allison and Judy for being here, for everyone for stepping up uh, and fighting for a better future for all. And mostly, I want to invite and thank my friend Miriam for inviting me here today. It starts here in the Durham region. We have a great slate of candidates here in the Durham region, and many of them are with us here tonight. I want to say how proud I am of someone who a few years ago, a business leader, a mom, a passionate advocate, a counselor, came and We're not stuck with Justin Trudeau who says a lot of things, does a lot of things for show, but never delivers on it. We can vote for new Democrats who are going to fight for you and your families and put you first. A big question in this election. What about other parties like the People's Party and the Green Party? How much room will there be for them in the 44th Parliament of Canada? Here to weigh in our political pundits on the last day of the federal election campaign. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the show. Election Day is uh, today, the big day that everybody has been waiting for. Uh, and so um, joining me today to discuss that is Susan Delacourt, national columnist for the Toronto Star, uh, who's also been paying super uh, closely attention to the election. So, Susan, uh, as the campaign finishes, I'm just wondering what the biggest thing is that, that you're going to be watching for tonight and that you suspect uh, many Canadians should watch for tonight as well. Well, I think surprises, you know, we, we forget that, you know, we watch the polls so closely during the campaign and we think we know how it's going to go, but there's always a surprise. Uh, in 2015, um, Trudeau had been not expected to win at the beginning and certainly not a majority. And that was because the Liberal campaign is very, very good at getting out the vote on the ground. Um, in 2019, there was a real chance he would lose. And again, they fight riding to riding, door to door, doorstep to doorstep. And I think this is an election campaign that's going to be decided really locally. I think that people are ultimately going to say, yeah, the national story is one, but I have spent the past 18 months confined to my community, and I'm going to vote on what's best for my community right here. Okay, and um, I'll ask you a question uh, regarding the NDP. Uh, how many seats do you think um, the NDP has to win in order for Jagmeet Singh to stay on? Remember, obviously, I, I believe it was 44 seats that Tom Mulcair won, and uh, he was you know, ousted from his party as party leader in 2019. Jagmeet Singh only won 24, uh, and, and he got, he's gotten to stay on as party leader. So how many seats do you think uh, will kind of be the bar for Jagmeet Singh to stay on? So I'm going to do the political thing and not really answer that question, <laughs> um, because I think there's a very big difference. The NDP believes, I, or they, they believed, that people not liking Tom Mulcair kind of cost them the election in 2015. So it was a personal animosity. I don't think Jagmeet Singh's likability is an issue in this campaign. If anything, it is helping them. So I think he has earned the right just with his sunny ways and uh, his happy campaign and, and it tapped into something else out there uh, that I, I don't think anybody in the end, you know, I haven't talked to anybody in the NDP about that, but I don't think that they are setting a numerical, you know, maybe if he won only two seats, they might have a little talk with them, but all indications are that the NDP has not grown in support since 2011. They have lost seats every campaign since then. So I think if he grows the party beyond what it was, he's probably okay. So, I mean, in terms of, I'll ask you a similar question uh, regarding the Greens, but perhaps it's a little bit more uh, easy to answer and it has some other components to the question. Um, and it's specifically around the Green Party turmoil, um, do you think this turmoil has been put on on pause due to the election or do you think it's been fully put to rest and do you think even after uh even after tonight if Annamie Paul loses her seat and, and decides to try and stay on as leader do you think 
part of this turmoil could come back and, and, and could start up again? There are signs that the turmoil is not completely over and that comes from her. She said that some of the candidates didn't want her to visit them, which I found a very sad thing. Um, so I, I think it's my, my best guess is that it's on pause. I, I think she has a lot to be proud of in this campaign, particularly her debate performance, but she herself has given some indication that things are not all well inside the Green Party. And so the Liberals and Justin Trudeau have been uh, using things like gun control, uh, climate change. Uh, they used things like uh, vaccinations uh, to use against Aaron O'Toole and, and to attack Aaron O'Toole's stance on it. Do you think, though, that uh, these talking points have been have been working? And do you think that the conservative stance on these issues could really sway the election into the Liberals' favor? It's hard to say. I don't think the Liberals anticipated when they went into this campaign that it would be as much of a referendum or discussion about Justin Trudeau as they had expected. I actually think they believed this was going to be a referendum on Aaron O'Toole. So some of this has been a bit of a distraction, you know, that um, it, it, it's, uh, it's been an attempt to make this campaign about things that we haven't been talking about for two years here in Canada. Um, I think what uh, the hope is, I guess in the liberal camp is that reminding them of not just O'Toole um, attributes, which are hard to pin down, but about conservative, what conservatives were known for, especially in the time of Stephen Harper, that that will remind Canadians of why they elected Trudeau. But I, I saw all those, those attempts to change the channel as, as an avoidance of the discussion of what is at issue here, and we've all been hearing it, um, that, that a lot of people are angry with Mr. Trudeau for sometimes good reasons and sometimes crazy reasons as you saw in, I saw in, in Cambridge, Ontario. But there is, a, there's a frustration out there and it, it, people are finding a way to vent it at, uh, at the Liberal leader, Prime Minister. And I'll ask you one uh, final question before uh, we wrap up, uh, and it's in terms of smaller parties uh, like the People's Party. Uh, they seem to be the type of people, uh, as you mentioned, that are showing up at Justin Trudeau's events. If you, um, uh, I went to one in uh, Newmarket as well uh, when he was there a couple of weeks ago, and uh, that was actually probably um, some of the uh, my sources told me that that was probably one of the worst ones. Uh, that that uh, in terms of protesters that were there, um, but the majority of the protesters there had People's Party of Canada signs and stuff. And so, um, do you think that that they will have uh, much of a future after tonight? Meaning the People's Party? It's really hard to say. I don't think they need to win a seat tonight for that for them to have made a difference in this campaign. It's not just the vote splits, and I think I'm not the only one. I'm worried about what they've unleashed in this campaign. Uh, I said, you know, we always expected the pandemic to be politicized, but we didn't expect it to be radicalized. And some of those people supporting the People's Party have good reasons. They're not just crazy anti-vaxxers. They're, they resent the consensus around this, that they don't feel that any political party is representing them. And I've seen that before in politics where people don't feel represented. And I think, you know, whoever wins tonight is gonna to have to reflect on what that mood is out there and what fueled it, whether it's economic despair, hopelessness, an absence of a voice. But I, I think if we, you know, I get bad mail from angry people comparing it to Donald Trump, but I, I do think we have to be careful that we handle this better than the United States did where you see that getting out of control. All right, well, uh, Susan Delacourt, national columnist for the Toronto Star, uh, it's been great talking with you. And I'm sure as you do, I look forward to uh, watching the results come in tonight and uh, have a whole new parliament in the House of Commons. I certainly uh, have been waiting to get back to watching question period and stuff. So uh, that'll be exciting for sure. And uh, yeah, thanks again for joining me. Enjoy tonight. Thank you. What are the NDP doing to prepare for the big night? Here's my conversation with John Iveson of the National Post, who was covering the NDP as he joined the show. All right, everybody. So welcome back. So uh, John Iveson is joining me now, a national 
uh, columnist and uh, parliamentary bureau chief for Post Media. He's on the road with the NDP right now. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. So perhaps we can uh, talk quickly about the NDP and about some things that uh, they need to do uh, in this election. So maybe our, uh, as a first topic, how do you think uh, the NDP and Jagmeet Singh will uh, define success in this election? Well, that's a good question. We asked him that this morning and uh, we asked if he didn't add to his seat count, would he consider resigning? Well, Jagmeet is very upbeat in all weathers, uh, despite the fact we're in British Columbia and it's raining. Uh, he said he's proud of his campaign. He's very confident. I think they will define success as adding seats. Now, at one point in the campaign, it looked like they might double their seat count from 24. I don't think they're going to double it. I don't even think they're probably going to get to 40. But if he adds 10 seats across the country, then it's a, it's a success for him. I think an even greater success would be a minority liberal government, which obviously would leave him in the driving seat as far as demanding what he wants from, from uh, Justin Trudeau. Because as a, in the last parliament, they didn't have enough seats to be the only dance partner for the Liberals. If they got to somewhere like 35 and, uh, and Trudeau was um, you know, somewhere around 150, then all he needs to do is strike a deal with Jagmeet Singh and he can govern for quite a period of time. There's writings um, in Vancouver and on Vancouver Island. Uh, I'd give an example like Nanaimo Ladysmith, uh, the Greens, Paul Manley currently holds it. Um, but what do you think the NDP has to do in order to, to win back a riding like Nanaimo Ladysmith? Well, Nanaimo Ladysmith is kind of interesting because I, I was there with Erin O'Toole and the Conservatives think they can win that one. So it's a, it's a three-way fight really there. Um, you know, I think he's a great retail politician. He's one of the best retail politicians I've seen. He's likable. He's had a problem converting likability into votes. And my personal view on that is that, that people still have a problem with the NDP brand. They feel that it's not serious when it comes to the economy, when it comes to creating jobs, and that the constant harping on of squeezing billionaires to pay for your platform is not realistic. You know, there are 47 billionaires in Canada. Uh, John Chrétien once said, nothing is as, as nervous as a million dollars. It moves quickly and it doesn't speak any language. And the message from that is that if you try and go after big money, big money will just disappear. And, uh, you know, I, I've asked Singh on the campaign trail, your platform suggests you're going to raise $60 billion by in your wealth tax, which is a 1% tax on wealth over $10 billion. Um, you know, even the parliamentary budget officer had to bend over backwards to, uh, to make that calculation. They, they ended up saying, well, each person's wealth will take 35% off it uh, to account for behavioral responses, i.e. people squirreling the money away in tax havens. Why 35%? Well, why not? But I think that's the problem with the NDP for many people is that it's it doesn't do the homework on some of the heavy lifting, which is how do you pay for the $200 billion in additional spending of community? Okay, and uh, I'll just ask you one more last question because I know you have to go now. Um, but in terms of to, um, to, uh, election night, what do you think uh, is, is something that the NDP should be watching for and that all Canadians should watch for in regards to the NDP? Well, there are certain seats um, that, that are key to them. We, this morning we were in a seat called uh, Burnaby North Columbia. And, um, sorry, Burnaby North Seymour. And that is currently held by the Liberals. I think if you start to see seats like that go to sing, then he might, might well get his uh, doubling of the number of seats, take him up somewhere close to 50. Um, you know, there are, there are other seats that we visited. We were in, you know, Davenport in downtown Toronto. Davenport is a, a gettable writing for them. It used to be New Democrat. I think they could possibly win that one. If they start winning seats in downtown Toronto, Toronto Danforth is another one, then they're having a, a good night. We went to Kingston and the Islands. Again, a Liberal seat. If they win that, if they win Halifax, you know, these are seats that if they convert from, from, uh, from red to orange, then we've got a new dynamic in Parliament. All right, John, thanks so much for joining me. And, uh, Thank back. you. Good luck. Bye. Bye. What about the Conservative Party? How are they preparing for election night? Here's my conversation with Michael Barrett. 
Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Joining me now is the conservative candidate for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes, uh, who is also the conservative critic for ethics in the last parliament, Michael Barrett. Uh, Michael, thank you for joining me. Um, I'm going to start out with a question um, just relating to your party and relating to why people uh, should vote for your party. Um, in terms of the conservative party, there's often been, um, I guess you could say, a stereotype kind of, and I talked about this with Aaron um, in regards to um, their policy on uh, the environment, um, especially now their policy on gun control. You've seen lots of things uh, coming out from the liberals over the past few days. So just what would you say to someone who, you know, is maybe considering voting uh, conservative, but some of the recent things said by members from other parties have uh, made them a little bit unconvinced too? Well, first, I'd just say it's a real pleasure to join you. And uh, thanks so much for, for asking me to be on with you. Um, look, I've been a conservative MP um, since 2018, and uh, this is my third election. And I'm really excited to be running with the uh, under Canada's recovery plan. I encourage anyone who's considering running for us to go to conservative.ca and see for yourself. Don't take uh, don't take someone's uh, meme on on Facebook or Twitter uh, at face value. Uh, take a look at the at the platform that we're offering. Um, I have, with respect to your question on the environment, I have five children all under the age of eight. I'm very concerned about, about the environment that, uh, that we're, I'm going to turn over to, to my children. So I think it's incredibly important that we're uh, responsible stewards of our environment and, uh, and take action on climate change. And, and I uh, am excited about the plan that we've put forward to do that. And, um, and on public safety, I am, again, uh, very uh, proud of the plan that we have on public safety. And with respect to firearms, I am a uh, steadfast supporter of the very strong world-class um, system that we have in Canada for licensing and regulating firearms. It's just so important for public safety. Um, we've, got, we've got regulations like no other country. And can they be improved? Absolutely. And there are, there are a number of things that I... Uh, um, I think that we can do to make sure that we can keep our community safe. But I, I would just say in a nutshell, uh, take a look at our plan and uh, and see for yourself, because uh, this is not the conservative party of, uh, of 50 years ago. Um, we're, we're young and uh, we've got a real strong vision for future, a strong vision for Canada. I just want to um, ask you one more question on gun control and then we'll go on to our last question, um, because there was lots of people that were... Um, like snipping pictures of the um, conservative platform. And um, it, it initially said the conservatives um, would would repeal the uh, gun control bill that was put in place by the liberals. But then there was then a part that was added to it that said um, all assault weapons that are currently banned will remain banned. So can you maybe just help clarify to um, some people who are listening in regards to that? Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, and, and when we're talking about something that's so important, like public safety, like firearms, I think it's really important that we remove misinformation from that conversation. And one of the uh, often used terms and a misunderstood term is, is assault weapons. And um, for context, I served in the Canadian forces. I was trained to, to use the, um, uh, the firearms, the weapons that, uh, that, that soldiers use. And, um, and I am now as a civilian, a licensed uh, gun owner. I have my, non-restricted and my restricted possession and acquisition license. So I have a very good understanding of, um, of what the regulatory system is and the different types of firearms. Um, automatic weapons have been banned in Canada since before I was born. Uh, they were banned in, in uh, 1977, I believe. And with respect to um, the, uh, the changes that were made under the, under the Liberal government, we've said all along that what we want is a depoliticized classification process for firearms. So not based on how they look, but how they perform technically. And um, do they have a purpose for, um, for sport shooting, for hunting? Uh, is, that their, is, that what their, um, is that what their technical specifications are, are best suited for? That, that's what we should be making these decisions based on, not based on uh, politicians who, you know, put up a picture of something that looks scary and then clip a piece of, uh, of you know, uh, an opposing party's platform to try and stoke fear. Um, you know what, when, when we're talking about something like gun crime, when we're talking about something like keeping our community safe, I think that we should 
um, find some common ground. Uh, and that's where we should start from, not look to polarize people. Uh, I, I think that in this election, uh, it's important to remember that everyone who's running for office really is looking to to keep, uh, you know, and, and to, they want the best Canada for, for everyone. And we've got different ways of getting there. But um, I, I don't think it's helpful to uh, to mischaracterize um, you know, how, how sincere or genuine is about keeping Canadians safe. And our plan, uh, Canada's recovery plan, is, uh, is very clear about what we're going to do to, to keep Canadians safe, uh, specifically with respect to, uh, to firearms regulation and the classification process. And um, I'll just ask you one final question. As I mentioned, you were the conservative critic for um, ethics. And so when we um, look at the uh, Trudeau government, you were um, involved in criticizing the Trudeau government for the WE scandal. Um, I'm not too familiar with um, your stance on uh, SNC, obviously. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you uh, oppose the Trudeau government's actions there, but um, I, I, I don't necessarily know if you were the ethics critic then. But um, just in terms of, I mean, I don't necessarily think a lot of those things have been discussed uh, in this election campaign, but maybe talk a little bit about um, the things that have happened under the Trudeau administration that you would oppose. Yeah, so um, with respect to the SNC Lavalin uh, scandal, I was actually a member, uh, um, a regular member of the Justice Committee when those hearings were held, and so I was very much on the front lines and saw um, the uh, the evidence come out and heard the testimony from uh, from the former Attorney General Jody Wilson Raybould, and uh, you know it was very clear to us at the time that there had been an attempt by the Prime Minister to use his office to interfere in the criminal prosecution of SNC Lavalin and ultimately um, that that resulted in Mr. Trudeau being found to have breached the Ethics Act and um, completely inappropriate to um, to not just blur but to step over the line uh, into the judiciary from uh, from the executive branch of government. So very concerning, really undermines Canadians' confidence that they can have in our government institutions. Um, but that wasn't the first time. We also saw with uh, with the trip to Billionaire Island, uh, Mr. Trudeau's first time being found guilty of breaking the Ethics Act. You no, know, really, just not thinking that the rules applied to him. That was the Trudeau report one, uh, Wyatt. And then, of course, with the uh, the Wee scandal, we saw one of the most senior members of Mr. Trudeau's team found guilty of breaking the Ethics Act. That was Mr. Morneau, uh, the subject of the Morneau report too. But really, we had uh, Mr. Trudeau's family. Um, who were who were being uh, paid by the WE organization, who was then given a um, you know the sole sourced half a billion dollar contract when half a million dollars had been paid to the prime minister's family. So Canadians deserve good ethical government. Um, you know it. Uh, you know just uh, just staying inside the bounds of what's legal is not enough. Canadians deserve better. They need a government that. Um, that is uh, beyond reproach with respect to their ethical dealings. And we've very much not seen that. And it's really, as I said before, undermined Canadians' confidence. They deserve better. And, uh, and of course, that's why I'm running and, and we're looking to provide an ethical alternative to the current government. All right, Michael Barrett, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, it's been great talking with you and uh, good luck in the election. Hey, thanks so much, Wyatt. And thanks for indulging me just coming right off the doors uh, to talk to you from, uh, from Prescott, Ontario tonight. Have a good night. You too. What about the Liberal Party? How are they preparing for election? And how are they going to get the majority government that they crave? Here's my conversation with Liberal Party of Canada candidate in London North Centre, Peter Fregascados. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome back. Joining me now uh, via phone is Peter Fregascados. He's the Liberal candidate and incumbent MP for the riding of London North Centre. Thank you, Peter, for joining me. So we're going to get started right away. Um, Election uh, night will be very interesting. Uh, there's no doubt about it. There's going to be lots of close races um, that that, uh, that that will be happening. And uh, one of them could be um, London North Centre. The NDP uh, was competitive there for a short while of time. So maybe just speak first off um, a little bit about your local riding of uh, London North Centre, some of the candidates there, and uh, just what you're uh, going to be doing tomorrow as uh, we head into Election Day. Sure, Wyatt. So London North Centre is a it's a great riding, and I've had the opportunity to represent it as its member of parliament since 2015. Uh, there is it's very diverse in terms of its economic makeup. We have Western University, obviously one of the country's largest post-secondary institutions, and 
home to thousands of students. We have hospitals here. Uh, healthcare in London is really crucial for the city. It's an enormous employer. And London North Centre is home to an enormous uh, community of health workers. We have scientists, we have researchers, we have tech companies, we have uh, a downtown that has seen its challenges but has enormous potential for a rebound. We have invested heavily in helping that transition uh, by focusing on housing, by focusing on affordable housing in particular, and I want to continue that effort along with climate change, along with uh, reconciliation, along with ensuring the quality of opportunity. And of course, nothing happens without getting out of the pandemic. So that is the issue of the campaign. That is what uh, people have shared with me at the doors. And I'm sure they've shared that message with other candidates from other parties. And uh, while I have uh, certain disagreements on policy with the candidates from the uh, NDP and the Green Party and the Conservative Party, uh, I think we all agree on one thing, and that's the importance of democracy and the importance of standing up and, and trying to rep represent your country to the best of one's ability, and that's what they've all done. All right, and um, once again, as I mentioned, you're running in London North Centre. What have been some of the, obviously you mentioned getting out of the pandemic, but what have been some of the other key issues that you have been speaking about and that residents in the community have been telling you about? Well, apart from uh, the question of COVID-19, certainly climate change is something that comes up time and again, why at, at the doors. Uh, that is true regardless of who I'm speaking with. It could be a young person. It could be someone who's elderly. It could be someone who's uh, middle-aged. And, and they will share with me their concern about that. And of course, I've been able to share with them a long list of achievements that the Liberal go government has been able to put forth over the years and wants to continue with. The other thing I would highlight, and this is not something that I expected about a year ago, but certainly its uh, its importance has been underlined in the past, uh, well, in, in this election, but leading up to it as well, hearing about it from constituents, and that's housing prices. So housing affordability is has always been an issue uh, in our major cities like Vancouver and, and Toronto, for example. But as you know, because I know that you've interviewed many on this subject, including the Prime Minister, housing affordability has really become an issue in all our cities now and in even, uh, even in some of our towns. Uh, so I hear about that uh, very regularly at the doors. We, we do have a relatively high average home price in London at about $640,000. And young people look at that with concern, and so do their parents. And so I'm glad that at the heart of our platform has been, among other things, a plan to deal with that challenge. And just what would be your, uh, as one last question, what would be your final pitch to voters uh, on Election Day um, as they head into uh, the ballot box? Well, I would say that, Wyatt, if we look around the world, every day people struggle for the right to vote. Right, as part of their effort to achieve greater democracy. So take inspiration from that. I know that uh, in recent years, we have seen uh, a voter turnout rate that sometimes goes up, sometimes goes down from election to election. But we're very fortunate in Canada, and we should not take our democracy for granted. And yes, this election is happening during a pandemic, but our democratic institutions have to be strong enough to withstand that. And the message that comes from that, obviously, is go out and vote. You know, it doesn't have to be for me. Of course, I would love people to vote for me, Wyatt. Uh, any candidate would say the same. But I think people have to go out and cast a ballot, because if they don't, then democracy, by definition, doesn't exist. And that's a very precious thing, right? What makes democracy? Why is it so important? Why is it so valuable? Why do people not just struggle for it every day and the right to vote, but why do they die for that right? Right? It's the ability to have a voice in one's life, to fight for the things that matter to the individual, to the community, and, and that sustain the individual and the community. You know, that is what the vote is all about. So cast a ballot tomorrow. Uh, do so thoughtfully. If people haven't had a chance to look at the platforms in, in any detail, there's still time. They can vote until 9.30 tomorrow night. And yeah, I think it's uh, we can never take this democracy for granted, and and that's why voting is so is so vital. 
Alrighty, well, uh, thank you so much, Peter, for uh, calling in, Liberal candidate for London North Centre. Uh, it's been great talking with you, and uh, best of luck as we head into election night. Wyatt, thank you so much. And unfortunately, because of some Zoom challenges, I'm doing this interview from the car. But uh, if I'm fortunate enough to be reelected, I would love to sit down with you over Zoom so we can do a, a proper interview in the future. For sure. Thank you again. Thanks, Wyatt. How does the NDP plan to grow its seat count? Here's my conversation with NDP candidate Brian Chang. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Joining me now is Brian Chang, the NDP candidate for the riding of Toronto Centre, to give his perspective on how the NDP has been uh, managing the campaign over the past 36 days and uh, and also just about uh, his perspective on his local campaign in the riding of Toronto Centre. Brian, we were talking a little bit about this before we got started. You're running in uh, Annamie Paul's uh, riding, uh, which which will be interesting, um, you know, when, when voters head into the ballot box, having the leader of a party um, on, on their ballot. So maybe speak a little bit about why uh, the voters of Toronto Centre should put their uh, trust in you, or at least progressive voters should put their trust in you as opposed to uh, Anime Paul. Absolutely. So I think, first of all, uh, I live in the riding. I live at Young and College, which I think is important, especially this is the smallest geographic riding in the entire country. It's about six square kilometers, but there's over 100,000 people that live here. Um, and it has many different pockets from St. Jamestown, which is the densest neighborhood in the entire country, uh, to the Career Village, which I live on the edge of. Um, and there, there are so many different pieces. But for me, what it's been about is that over the course of the pandemic, we've really seen so many of uh, the fault lines in our communities really ripped open. Um, and I just think about the the dire need that a lot of uh, seniors and low-income people have been facing in terms of access to food security and just making sure that they have food on the table. And that's been, uh, it's been really hard over the course of the last few months, but I stepped up with community uh, community agencies in the area to to find and help secure access to food, help uh, every Saturday I help out at the Spanai for Your Community Cares. Um, market at uh, St. Lawrence Market, which helps uh, help seniors in the area access food. And during the during the vaccination period, we were actually helping these seniors sign up for vaccines at the same time. And that's just an example of the work that I've been doing in the community. It's as somebody who's who shows up and and is around and not just during election times for me. I'm very invested in this community and making sure that people have access to affordable housing, tackling a climate emergency, uh, making sure that we're dealing with the opioid crisis and making sure that we're we're building a, a more equitable future that lifts the floor for everybody and not just the ultra rich and the ultra wealthy. All right. And um, what made you kind of want to get involved uh, and, and run for office? And I mean, if, if the voters do uh, place their, their trust in you on election night, what would, um, what would be some of the key issues that you would like to fight for in the House of Commons? So I started getting involved in the environment and it was kind of, it was my main issue uh, when I was in high school. And uh, I learned about the greenhouse gas effect and it was something that uh, was, I thought was scary at the time and something that I continued to study through university. I would volunteer when I was in high school, I volunteered at Greenpeace, um, doing a lot of work on the clear cut campaigns and the, the logging of old growth forests in Northern Ontario. And then I would do my environmental policy, uh, my undergrad in environmental policy and practice at the University of Toronto. And then I went on to do my master's in environmental studies at York University. And my uh, area of concentration during my master's was specifically in subnational climate change policy and Canadian environmental federalism. And why that was important for me was because I was I was recognizing the danger of our uh, of what the way that we were treating the environment and the way that people are treated through that process as well too. And for me, justice is really core to that discussion. And I was finding that it wasn't really happening. We were having these discussions about the environment, but we weren't tackling it from a justice perspective. And that continues to this day. So the fact that half of my life I've known that the climate emergency was was an issue that we needed to tackle, and that in 2021 we are now the third largest polluter in 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 out of G7 nations and that we're the only G7 nation that has seen its uh, greenhouse gas emissions go up since 2016 is really problematic we're just not on the right path in any way shape or form and I thought that in 2015 I had a lot of hope that Justin Trudeau would be one of would, would actually live up to some of those expectations would actually put in a carbon tax that would that would matter that would actually lead to some uh, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and that didn't happen so it was one of those points in time I realized that unless 
I was willing to step up and be one of those people that would fight. And I couldn't expect other people to do that work because other people were stepping up uh, and they were liberals and they were just not doing the job. And they're still not doing the job, in my opinion. One of the reasons why I and many new Democrats uh, are stepping forward to take the lead on things like the climate emergency. Sorry, uh, you mentioned um, about the carbon tax and about um, some some things relating to uh, climate change. So maybe speaking a little bit about climate change and speaking a little bit about more about, uh, I know you mentioned a little bit about it, but talk a little bit more about um, the NDP's climate change plan and, and the NDP's carbon pricing plan um, in, in just regards to what would they do to the liberal carbon tax to, um, you, you kind of mentioned that you didn't feel it was uh, efficient as it could be. So maybe speak a little bit about that. Absolutely. So Carbon pricing is one economic tool that we can use that is market-based. Uh, but what we actually need to do is change the complete tra trajectory of what are the way the way our society basically like gets around uh, by invest by changing from fossil fuel emitting cars to zero emission vehicles, by the way that we heat our homes, uh, by switching off of natural gas to electricity, uh, by the way that we power our homes by moving from uh, from natural gas. Uh, fired power plants to from coal, from diesel, um, from nuclear, from uh, to uh, to renewable energy sources. So it's about investing in all of those different pieces, uh, but also from from a society based point as well too. It's also making sure that people have access to what they need because oftentimes, and we've seen this over the course of the pandemic, the climate emergency really took a back burner because everybody was so focused on the issues around the pandemic and not not being losing their homes, losing their jobs, losing their extended health care, uh, losing not being able to to pay for for basic necessities and needs. Like when those issues are unaddressed we also contribute worse to the climate emergency. So these aren't separate issues for New Democrats and for me as somebody who's running for office, they're very much related. In terms of carbon pricing, uh, right now the largest emitters are actually exempt from the, car the current carbon pricing scheme in Canada, and that's simply unacceptable. We're talking about the largest um, greenhouse gas emissions uh, and producers in the entire country. We have some other options. Uh, so by looking at methane, um, by looking at protecting 30% of our freshwater um, oceans and land by 2030, single use plastics ban. Um, but I also, we're also calling for an office of environmental justice. So, and, and also implementing uh, a climate accountability office. So like the parliamentary budget officer, like uh, the auditor general, having this, this arm's length uh, officer that's that reports only to parliament that can keep track of and and report on the, the progressive government um, in terms of meeting its climate targets. And right now we don't have that. Um, so it means that we really rely on the government of the day to tell us whether we're doing a good job or not. Uh, and that's I don't think that's that's enough. We wouldn't we wouldn't leave our budget simply up to the government to determine whether it was uh, accurate or not. That's why we have entities like the Auditor General as well as the as the Parliamentary Budget Officer because these um, We've recognized the need for these uh, for this extra bit of information and, and these arms length uh, parliament uh, arms length or uh, agencies um, to 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 have the resources to look at government and be like this is what you're doing well and this is what you're not doing well. All right, Brian. Well, um, thank you for joining me today, and uh, it's been great chatting with you. And uh, best of luck on uh, on election night. Yeah. Thanks so much, Wyatt. How is the Green Party preparing for election night? Here's my conversation with Green Party of Canada candidate, Phil DeLuna. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the show. Joining me now is Phil DeLuna. He's the Green Party candidate for the riding of Toronto St. Paul's. Uh, so, Phil, I'm going to start out with a question of just, I guess, why did you get involved in, in politics and just more specifically, why should the voters in uh, Toronto St. Paul's, which has historically been a liberal riding, uh, give you the Green Party candidate their support? Great question. So I'm a scientist by background. I have a PhD from the University of Toronto in material science and engineering. And I worked at the National Research Council before this, where I, my job was to develop clean technology. So I know exactly what it takes to take technology out of the lab and into the marketplace. And I came to the realization that when it came to climate change, we have the technology, we know what we need to do. The science has been clear for such a long time, and yet we still are the only G7 country to continue to increase emissions year on year. So I thought, what's missing? There's got to be a gap. Why is it that we know what we have to do, but we're not doing it? And I realized that that gap was in political will and in policy. 
And so that's what really inspired me to get into politics. Um, I had a conversation with Andy Paul, the leader of the Green Party, last fall, I was, I was part of this Action Canada Fellowship, which is a, an accelerator program. Uh, one day you should do it. I think you'd be great at it. And uh, I, she, she was recruiting people for this next election. I didn't really know much about the Greens. I'd never been politically engaged before in my life. I never volunteered for a campaign or anything like that. But uh, I, it really resonated with me, her, her message and her desire to increase diversity uh, and to uh, try and highlight voices that aren't typically heard in Parliament. And so like many people over the past year with this pandemic, I had a moment to take a step back and, and reflect on what is the impact that I want to leave on this world. And I felt if not now, when? So I, I took the plunge and I decided to run for office uh, for the Greens. And to the second point of your question, why me versus Minister Carolyn Bennett, who has been, uh, you know, the sitting MP since 1997. And I'll, I'll begin by saying that, that Minister Bennett, um, I respect her greatly for all the years of service that she's done. When I first decided I was going to run for office uh, and I became the candidate, um, and this was all back in May, I reached out to Minister Bennett and I said, hey, I'm Phil, I just wanted to introduce myself, expecting no reply back. She replied, she gave me 45 minutes of her time, and throughout this entire campaign, we've met each other on the campaign trail, and it's been nothing but positive and cordial. That being said, I do feel that Toronto St. Paul's is not the same as it was in 1997. The, the people of Toronto St. Paul's are more diverse, are younger, are, 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 are looking for change. And it's a very dynamic and energetic riding. And I think that the people of Toronto St. Paul's are looking for new leadership and, and new ideas and, and fresh perspectives going forward. And, and I th I'm focused on the solutions. I'm focused on trying to uh, uh, look at three main things, green jobs that leave no one behind, uh, housing that all can afford and supporting our essential workers. And each of those three things, I believe, uh, represent and uh, speak to the people of Toronto St. Paul's, whether it's a professional and affluent class that live in the center of the riding. You know, my, my background as an entrepreneur in technology, talking about green jobs as the way to address the economic future in the 21st century, that's one. Uh, when it comes to housing affordability, all of the young people that live in, in the young corridor and the condos that are wondering, Will I ever be able to afford a home in the city that I, I love, in the, in the home that I grew up in? And then when it comes to supporting our essential workers, there's a large immigrant population to the west end of the riding, an artist community to the south. These are the folks who have been most hit by the pandemic. And we have to remember the lessons that we learned from this past year. And we have to value essential work as essential. So that's why I got into politics. That's why I think I'm going to be a wonderful uh, candidate and, and wonderful member of parliament. Uh, if you vote for me, you're going to get someone who works really hard, who has the skills to be able to solve big problems and who wants and is free to vote for the constituency 100 percent of the time because the Green Party does not whip votes. OK, and uh, I'll ask you two more questions. Um, the next topic is a question that is obviously tough for Green Party candidates and members to talk about. But in order for the Green Party uh, to win more votes, it, it does have to be talked about because otherwise people can still be on the fence with this issue. And it's it's regarding some of the turmoil and leaked documents that was um, put out a couple of months ago. I, I asked Anami uh, a question relating to that when she was on my show. And um, so it's just what would you say to somebody that, that is on the fence because they they seen news reports and they seen leaked documents that uh, came out regarding um, disagreements between the National Council and the party leadership? Well, I'll first say that the National Council has been completely changed over. There's a new mandate. So there's a brand new National Council and the majority of the folks who were a small and vocal minority in the last uh, National Council that were uh, sort of butting heads with anime, they're no longer there. So that's the first thing. The se second thing I would say is any organization, any party, you know, whether it's the Liberals, the Conservatives, the NDP, whether it's a large corporation like Costco or Nestle or Rogers, whenever there's a change in leadership, there's always going to be bound to be some disagreements between the new leader, the new CEO, and the management team. The, the same is... It's the same case with the Green Party. And I'll say this, uh, specifically for the Green Party, because of our, of our party structure and because we're such a grassroots party, you should really focus on who is your local candidate and is that local candidate strong and are they willing to work for you in Ottawa? Because that, the, the Green Party is all about the grassroots and all about the local candidate. 
uh, much of the turmoil that you've heard in the news has not impacted my campaign. It hasn't uh, impacted my ability to fundraise or draw uh, uh, um, volunteers. We, you know, we've reached 90% of the riding and we've knocked on over 40,000 doors or left a door hanger. We've touched 40,000 homes. Uh, I, my legs are jelly and I've lost 10 pounds. But, you know, this is the kind of this is what democracy looks like. This is democracy in action. And and uh, with a Green Party uh, MP, the, the leadership and the turmoil and the structure isn't as important because it's all about the grassroots. And if you vote and if you elect a Green MP, you're going to have a local champion for you. OK, Phil. And um, as I mentioned, we're um, uh, getting closer to um, the, the, the night and uh, the night where Canadians will decide uh, who, who will represent them in Ottawa. So just um, kind of relating back to the first question I asked you, but just what would you say to a voter who is still on the fence right now? And let's say, you know, oftentimes there's people who have um, voted for one party for such a long time. And I think that could be the case in uh, a riding like Toronto, St. Paul's. There's going to be a lot of people, as you mentioned, uh, Minister Bennett has been there since 1997. Um, so there's going to be a lot of people that, um, you know, generally vote liberal. But what would you say to those people who have been lifetime liberal supporters or people who have been lifetime supporters for a different party um, and, and, and try to win over their vote? Yeah, well, I would say, you know, a vote for the Greens is a vote for action on climate change, first and foremost. A vote for the Greens is a message to Ottawa that they need to take climate change more seriously, that they need to take progressive policies like universal basic income, like a, a, a guaranteed livable income, like tuition free education, like long term health care reform. All of these things, you know, that, that the Green Party and the policies that, that the Green Party have put forward into the Canadian discourse there is, there's such an important role for that, the important role for, for innovation and disruption. So I would say for people who are on the fence and specifically to the voters in Toronto St. Paul's, uh, in this election, and specifically in Toronto St. Paul's, you, there, there are two options, really. I mean, the, the Conservatives have run a, a candidate that doesn't live in the riding, hasn't actively campaigned. The NDP have, have run a, a, a candidate who has resigned over... Um, uh, some very unfortunate comments that she made on her Twitter. Uh, and so the, the choice is really between uh, Minister Bennett and myself. And my question to you is, are you happy with the way that things have gone? Are you happy with the fact that we're in an election that was unnecessary and needed in the moment when we're in a global pandemic, in the moment where we're surrounded by wildfires and having a, a, a global humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan? Are, are you happy with the status quo or do you want someone with fresh ideas, with a new voice that wants to work collaboratively in parliament and is willing to represent you? So the choice is clear. It's, it's either between myself or Minister Bennett at this point. And it's really about the status quo or something new. Um, and the choice is yours. All right, uh, Phil DeLuna, Green Party candidate for Toronto St. Paul's. Uh, thanks for joining me and uh, best of luck. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's been a pleasure. Bye now.